Hello, welcome to ECTV. My name is Michael. And I'm Ryan. On today's show, Annabelle and Brooke will be discussing traveling abroad in the world of photography. Annabelle is in the studio with El Camino student M. Samuels, who just recently returned from studying abroad in Israel. Hello, I'm Annabelle, and I'm here with M. Samuels, who's just returned from a semester abroad in Israel. Today, we'll be discussing how this trip has affected them emotionally and how it's drawn them closer to their heritage. So, what prompted you to travel abroad to Israel? Um, well, I'm a devout, reform, um, progressive Jew, and so I, I, growing up as a Jew, I've always known, you know, Israel's the homeland of my people, um, and I figured there was a program that was available for me to take, so I jumped at the opportunity to see it for myself. Um, what program was that? It was um, NIFTY, NFTY, the North American Federation of Temple Youth, they do a program, um, a semester abroad program with high school students from all across America known as EIE, um, Eisendrath International Experience, I believe. Um, where in Israel were you staying? I was staying um, at a place called Kibbutz Tsuba. Um, it's in the Judean Hills, about 20 minutes outside of Jerusalem. Now, what exactly is a kibbutz? Okay, so a kibbutz is like communism almost on a very tiny scale. Um, it's kind of like a commune um, where everybody who works there gets the same salary, everybody um, gets a certain allotment of money that goes to, you know, how much food they can buy, any luxuries, things like that, depending on how many people are in their family. Um, there's a communal dining hall and everybody there is there willingly and they work for the good of the community. Now is this a common thing in Israel? Do many people kind of yeah, it, it, it used to be more common um, when, the, when Israel was being founded in the early 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and since then, the, the government and the economy of Israel has become more Western. So kibbutzim, they've kind of downsized a little bit. And there are fewer active ones, but they are still um, fairly common in Israel. Now, what did you do while you were in Israel? Like, what was your daily routine? What did it consist of? Um, on an average day, we would wake up, um, we'd go to a two-hour Hebrew class, a three-hour Jewish history class, um, have a lunch break, and then there were seven shorter blocks in the afternoon so that we could make sure we were doing all of our general studies classes so that we could be caught up when we got home in America. But um, that being said, we were often on field trips or in Hebrew tiulim, um, we'd go around the country and anything that we were learning in Jewish history class once or twice a week We'd go out on a field trip and we'd go to the place where these things happened um, To enhance the learning experience. So that was also part of our regular routines Kind of just traveling all over the place and learning How did living in another country develop your relationship with other expats that you went with? It was insane um, there are things that you don't think you're going to do with other people that you end up doing with other people. <laughs> um, sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're embarrassing, sometimes they're sad, but um, really they just end up contributing to lifelong connections that you make with these people. Oh my gosh, yes. I had the same experience in Japan where you know sometimes you're just thinking about like, oh, I miss that person and I only knew them for a few days. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And if that happens over a few days. I was there from the end of August exactly. to the end of I'm December. On. It was so, so, so crazy um, how close you get with these people in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. um, how did this experience impact you, uh, reshape your worldview, and bring you closer to your heritage? Um, well, in terms of how it impacted me, um, to put it very simply, it strengthened my Jewish identity. I was raised Jewish, so I was new, like, hey, my family's Jewish, so I'm Jewish. That's kind of how it works, right? But um, recently, in the past couple of years, um, I've started to find my own Jewish identity, not that of my parents. Mm -hmm. um, but being in Israel with this program, with other like-minded, um, progressive, modern Jewish teens, um, 
it really made me find my own reason why I am Jewish, not just because I was raised that way. Um, in terms of my worldview, well, my, my views of patriotism, of Zionism, um, how I feel about the state of Israel and about the United States of America and things like that, and my political views, um, that, that was a big deal. Everybody always talked about politics. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, particularly my patriotism um, was really reshaped um, in that way. And for the heritage portion, like I said, Israel, the land of Israel is the, homes, the homeland of the Jewish people, right? But um, for me, the most impactful part in that sense was when we went on a trip to Poland for a week while we were studying about the Holocaust. Um, and I led a Shabbat service on a Friday evening um, in the synagogue that my family used to pray in, um, in a town next to Auschwitz where they were all murdered. So um, I've always known that I had connections with Jews in Europe, with the Holocaust, and that's just something I knew as a part of my past um, and the past of my family, but um, I definitely felt more of a connection not only with the Jewish people, but with my own, you know, flesh and blood, with my own family, um, bringing Jewish life back into the place where they were murdered for being Jews. So that's just that's so sobering. Yeah, um, it was really intense. <laughs> yeah, I cried a lot. <laughs> I'm sure that's wow. Did you experience any uncomfortable aspects of culture shock, such as language barriers, currency exchange, or different customs? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, I don't know a whole lot of Hebrew, and I knew even less going into the program. And while a lot of people in Israel do speak English, all the signs are in Hebrew, and like just the common language. If you're walking down the street, you hear people speaking Hebrew, and um, do they talk really fast? Oh my gosh, so fast! <laughs> <laughs> and I, I understand more than I can speak, and so sometimes there's that moment of somebody's saying something to me, and I just be like. I don't know how to respond to you. <laughs> um, and that eased up a little bit over time, but it was still, the language barrier was, was the hardest part. And um, on top of that, a lot of Israelis are very blunt. They're kind when you get to know them, but they're very blunt, very straightforward, sometimes very rude. Um, and people don't say, sorry, excuse me, when they're you know trying to get mm -hmm. past you, they just shove you out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had to get used to that as well, and I'm afraid that I might have brought some of that home with me. <laughs> Oof, yeah, I mean, and uh, when I was in Japan, you know, coming back to the U.S., it's like, I can read things in English now. I don't have to, like, try and translate what's yeah, that's, symbols. <laughs> that's, that's been the craziest part is coming home and being like, I can understand everything that's on a street sign or like turn on the radio and wait, I understand the language the song is in, what? Mm -hmm. it's, it's been pretty weird um, after living there for four months and being surrounded, immersed in that culture and then coming back to America and having everything be like, the world here hasn't changed all that much, <laughs> but my world has. What was the most memorable experience during your travels? Um, as incredibly impactful is all of the field trips and that time in Poland and um, and all of the the crazy hikes and taking an hour to get to the top of a mountain just so you can beat the sunrise and watching the sunrise from oh gosh everything was so so crazy and I have so many memories but I think the most memorable part for me was um, the bus rides, the day-to-day, -day, um, hanging out with the people, um, getting to know them, figuring out how we're alike and how we're different, and um, having challenging conversations about politics and beliefs and values. Um, and that's just something that happens when you're falling asleep and <laughs> your roommate's across the room and you're just like, oh, hey, I'm having an existential crisis. Want to talk me through it? Um, and sharing your earbuds on the bus and just getting close with these people that if I'm not going to know them for a lifetime, I'll definitely know them for a very long time. Yeah, those, those bonds last a yeah, long time. They're, they're, not, they're not going anywhere anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Have you experienced reverse culture shock since you've been back to the United States? 
For sure. Uh, yeah, I've started <laughs> saying things like when I'm out in public and if I accidentally bumped into someone, we'll be like, Oslicha, which is like, sorry, excuse me, in, in Hebrew. Um, or How does the average American respond to that? Like, <laughs> what uh, is that? Okay. <laughs> um, the word ma means what? So my mom will say something and be like, ma? And she's like, you've never called me ma before. I'm like, no, <laughs> mom, no, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, little, little things like that, um, getting used to Hebrew slang and, um, and Israeli culture and then coming back and um, having, having it be different again. Like as soon as I'm starting to get comfortable mm -hmm. in one culture, I have to go back and I'm getting used to this other one again. And um, it's finding, finding that balance, I think. Definitely. Would you ever consider living in Israel full time as an expat? Um, I I might. It, that's one of the biggest existential crises that I've been having. <laughs> um, um, in terms of how do I feel about the Israeli government, Israeli politics, Israeli economy, is that some place that I'd want to raise my children? Um, things like that. Um, how do I feel about Israel versus how do I feel about the U.S.? Is there something that I believe in that needs to be fought for here? Is there something I believe in that needs to be fought for there? Um, things like that, but I'll be living there for at least a year um, in graduate school. I plan on, after university, going to rabbinic school, and the school that um, I want to attend um, requires that first-year rabbinic students spend that year um, on the Jerusalem campus. Mm. So. I think that's really when I'm going to find out whether or not I'll want to make Aliyah, is what it is, how it's called in, in the Jewish community, to make Aliyah, to go up to the land of Israel um, permanently or not. But I will be living there for at least a year. Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> I'm excited. <laughs> Overall, would you recommend studying abroad to other students looking to expand their cultural awareness? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, I realized once I got there, how little I knew about myself as an American citizen and how much I knew about myself as a Jew. Um, and I, I've always prided myself on being educated. When I believe in something, when I'm passionate about something, I educate myself so that I can in turn educate others who may come to me with questions. Um, and with that being said, I realized how little education I really had. And like, I've grown up in Torah school my entire life. Um, I've been involved in the Jewish community my entire life. I've obviously I've lived in America my entire life, with the exception of those four months. And I realized how little I knew and how much I still have to learn after all that time there. Um, and I just think it's so important um, that if you're going to be passionate about something, you have to know why, and you have to be able to explain it, and you have to be able to understand it to the best of your ability. Um, so if you're gonna say, I'm gonna live in America for the rest of my life, why? Exactly. Why? Are, are, you, are you gonna say that because you know everything about- They, they wanna stay in like their- Because they wanna stay in their bubble, yeah, right? their comfort zone. In their comfort zone, and that makes sense. Who would wanna step out of their comfort zone willingly? It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, and it's scary, and this is the longest I've ever been away from my, from my mom, and. Um, my dogs, I miss them the most. <laughs> um, but honestly, it's so beneficial. And people say that it's a life-changing experience, that you're going to change, that when you come home, the world hasn't changed and you have not mm -hmm. nobody's going to understand you. And it's kind of true. It definitely is true. It, it definitely is true because you now have all of this information, all of this experience um, that... that People don't understand unless they've had the same one, and I'm I'm not gonna say I know everything and better than you. yeah I'm better than you I'm like super Jew what no I mean I I have a lot to learn um, and I'm not saying that I don't but I do recognize um, how impactful all of this information that I've taken in over the last four months was and is and will continue to be throughout the rest of my life. Well, Em, thank you so much for joining us today thank to you. share your experiences with us. We hope that your story will inspire others to explore and celebrate their own unique cultures and heritages as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Wow, what an amazing trip.
Now let's head to the studio with Brooke for her very own Hendricks experience with photography teacher William Hendricks. Hi, I'm Brooke. Today I will be talking with Ventura College professor William Hendricks about photography and its relevance today. Good to have you here. Thanks for inviting me. So to start out, is photography relevant? <clears throat> oh my gosh, that's like the million dollar question, isn't it? I know. You know, I think there's a lot of concern right now that photography may have lost its place in the culture, but I think it's actually going through a renaissance. You know, everybody's a photographer now with their phones and their DSLRs, and it's very instant. And, but I still think that the great images usually have to have two qualities. One is it has to be aesthetically pleasing. You know, it has to be something for the eyes, and it has to be intellectually compelling, so something for the brain, too. Mm -hmm. And I think the majority of the photographs out there don't, quite fit that. So when you understand those, those dimensions of what makes a great image, I think it's, it's helpful. And I think those people will really have a place in the future in image making. Yeah, sure. you have to filter out the images. Yeah, absolutely. there's so many small cameras out there. Yeah, um, absolutely. How long have you been in, photograph in the photography industry and what is your main focus? Oh, great. Well, the focus has changed a lot, but I think I started um, 48 years ago, something like that. Wow. And I really got interested when I think I, I was um, in college. I went to school in Santa Barbara, went to Brooks Institute, graduated, worked in Hollywood for a while, came back to get a master's, opened my own studio. So all that, those times were uh, mostly advertising, which I found extremely cold, but very lucrative. So I decided I had to change. So um, Venture College invited me to, to teach there. And so I applied and they hired me 27 years ago, which is really, kind of shocking because I never thought I could hold a job for more than five. So this is kind of a big deal. And then um, I got to change my emphasis. I became an, a fine art photographer and now I'm a travel photographer. I teach a lot of courses overseas and do that kind of thing. So do you think like teaching was your step in making your photography more um, visible and more out there? God, that's a great question. I mean, nobody's ever asked that. Um, I think it, it shaped who I was as a human being and who I was as a human being has always shaped my photographs. You know, because when you're constantly worried about the bottom line or making enough money because you have the studio overhead, that's all you think about. But mm -hmm. without that, now I can think about the quality of the image and how it's impactful and who's going to see it and all those things that were really especially soulful part of it. Especially because your job is so stable. Yeah. 27 years. For the, for, yeah, for the most for part, the most yeah. For the most part. Yeah. Um, so why did you decide to become a teacher? Because you wanted um, that promotion in your, mm. like, um, in your work? You know, I, I became a teacher for a lot of reasons, but the main was, I think, was to just try and make some sort of difference. I mean, I used to shoot fax machines and soap bottles, and you know, every six months they'd take that picture and throw it in the trash and have you make the new one, and you know, it just became empty. And I got some jobs working for Big Brothers Big Sisters, United Way, and I realized that those images could have an impact. And so I, um, I started focusing on that. And now that I'm a teacher, I can kind of use that and help motivate and try to inspire you know, students that come into my class. That's awesome. So I've heard that you um, go to the arts community in Cuba. So what do you do there and why do you go? Um, I've been traveling to Cuba for 23 years, 24 years. And it's partially because I think it's forbidden you know, for so many years. You know, you couldn't go to North Korea, you couldn't go to Cuba, you couldn't go to Syria, those places. And I've always been intrigued by those things that have been kind of, you know, off the radar. Um, Cuba is fascinating. I mean, Cuba has everything that I want okay. in um, a space. It has mystery, it has ambiguity, and it has contradiction. And I love that. I mean, if I go to Paris, you know, two or three times in a year, I get bored because it's so predictable. But Havana, it's always changing. Politically, socially, culturally, it's just like... You know, it's like somebody's throwing rocks at your head all You'll the time. You'll always be able to find something new. Always, yeah. And politically, it's really interesting, as you probably know if you follow Cuba very much. There's a lot of stuff going on there. You know, I think Paris has found its identity in the 20s and the 30s, and I think they're really happy with that. And I don't think that's wrong at all. I just think that if you want edge, you don't go to Paris. Yeah. You know, you want beauty and you want great art and, you know, good Parisian food, yeah. But if you want something that's edgy and surprising and full of contradiction, I don't think I've seen it in Paris, you know, even in the, I was in the, uh, the black market one time in Paris, which is right outside the swap meet area, mm -hmm. it's the pink line, I think, and there was some edgy people there, which I kind of enjoyed, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's a lot of nice shops and beautiful architecture, Yeah. which is great, but it's not, it's not edgy. What about Italy? Like, do you feel the same way with Italy? You know, I mean, Florence is beautiful. I've been to Rome. I have some friends that um, have a, a place in Tuscany, so I've spent some time there, too, but 
again, it's, you know, I don't know, I think they're, they've just figured it out and they're comfortable. Well, the Cubans haven't figured it out yet. I mean, they've been controlled by the Spanish and then the Americans and, you know, then the communists came in and tried to, you know, disrupt things and do their things. So they're still trying to figure all this out and I find that fascinating. They're having an identity crisis. A couple of them, yeah. yeah. So who do you take on these trips to Cuba? You know, all kinds of people. I mean, my, um, my eye doctor is gone. Um, I've taken a lot of students, professional photographers, filmmakers. Um, this last trip, we were um, going for the jazz festival in December, and I had um, Jennifer Finnegan, who is like a soap opera star. Mm -hmm. And she's um, won three Emmys, and so she was giving us soap opera tips while we were traveling around and listening to jazz. So I've had those kinds of people, and I've had, um, you know, just a big smattering of students, artists, and professionals. What is the art? artist community like in Cuba? It's booming right now. Um, there's a place called Fabrica de Arte. In fact, you, you'd probably love this because it's a, it's a great example of socialist art where they charge the artist $2 a month to show their work in this gallery. And it's a huge uh, plant that they've cleaned up and it was like an oil refinery plant that the government gave to these artists. So these guys go in, they create this space and it costs a dollar to get in. So it's affordable for artists and it's affordable for everybody. So when you get there, the line usually goes out the door, down the block, and around the corner. That's amazing. There's hundreds of people that want to go into this thing because it's the whole happening thing, and it changes every month. So, so cool. is it held year round? Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's it's everything from performance art, video art. It's um, 2D, 3D, um, homemade jewelry. Um, there's um, corners where people just play guitar and sing to each other, and spontaneous poetry. And so it's two floors, and there's all kinds of activity and fashion shows. It's just kind of whatever they make up at the moment. That's awesome. So how has the cultural and social evolvement affected the art of photography? Oh, wow. Well, I mean, I think photography always kind of tags along. You know, I always think that, you know, the culture and the political environment kind of leads the way, and then we artists, you know, observe it, digest it, and then we spit out a product, whether it's a poem or a movie or a photograph. And I think photography is, has always been doing that. The interesting thing now is I think photography and film are, are not separate anymore. I mean, they're one and the same. I mean, if you're mm -hmm. shooting with a DSLR these days, I mean, I have one that shoots a 42 megapixel file and a 4K video file. You know, so yeah. I could be making movies and stills all at the same time. Yeah. That's awesome. So how has the invention of the smartphone affected the photography industry? You know, I think it's kind of created, I mean, there's a, there's a greater sense of voyeurism now than I think I've ever noticed. And I think that people, you know, you know, they want, to, they want to look good on social media and because they take pictures of themselves with their friends, now everybody seems to take pictures of them, whether mm -hmm. they want it or not. Not, yeah. I was walking in, in L.A. yesterday, or last week actually, and somebody shot a video of me um, right outside Pershing Square in downtown L.A. and then sent it to somebody else who sent me a note saying, hey, Hendrix, I heard you're on Grand Avenue, you know, and I was like, that's how did you know this? The privacy. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's, that's really a big issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, do you think it's been a negative impact overall or positive? Oh my gosh, that's tricky. I mean, I can see both sides of that story, can't you? Yes, you I know? can, totally. I mean, I can see people being totally abused and then I can see people using this tool to save people's lives at the same time. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I think it's up to the person. You know, you've really got to be smart and thoughtful. Do you think the smartphone has, like, eradicated the camera? No, I don't. I think, they're, I think they're similar in some ways, but I mean, if you understand photography, which you probably do, I mean, there's so much more control that you have uh, with a DSLR where you Manual can adjust yeah, f-stops and shutter speeds. I think the smartphone is like a sketchbook. You know, it yeah. takes pretty nice snappies, but when you get serious about photography, I mean, there's so much more to it than just that quick recording the moment. And you can also adjust your settings, and cameras are much more versatile in that way. Yeah, and they're getting say. lighter, too. You know, the old days, they were big and clunky, and now they're pretty sleek and sweet. Yes, yes, exactly. Do you think um, technology has had a negative impact on the job growth in this industry? You know, I mean, I think for some people, yeah. There was a, I listened to a radio talk show um, a month ago. Um, Elizabeth Stewart <laughs> does a talk show, and she interviews artists in Santa Barbara. And this artist or this photographer friend of mine, Colin Finley, came on and he was just upset. He goes, you know, everybody has a phone, they have an app, and they're taking over my world. And I think that, you know, when writers, you know, were faced with, everybody's got a pencil. Oh my God, everybody's going to be a writer. You know, right. they didn't freak That's out. That's a great point. You know, it's like, just because they have a camera doesn't mean they're a photographer. I mean, you really have to start with an idea or a concept or a point of view. And frankly, most photographs I see are like, you know, and there's not much point of view. It's just like, dude, that's awesome. That's sweet, you know. 
Yeah. And I think that's, uh, I think photography is much more complex than that. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, where do you think the future of photography is? I think it's going to get smaller and faster. You know, I just see that because I think um, batteries are an issue and they're going to get better. Chips are, you know, becoming cheaper and faster and, you know. More it's just, gigabytes. Yeah, yeah. So I just think it's going to be faster. I think that, you know, we're going to have glasses that are going to be cameras pretty soon. As you probably know, Google's already Google done Glass, that. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are probably coming not the greatest. Soon. No. <laughs> yeah, it's like the first attempt, but you know. It'll happen. It'll probably happen. Yeah. What advice would you give to those interested in pursuing photography in this day and age? Oh, you know, you got to go get experiences. You know, if you keep reading the same blogs or the same books or watching the TV, same TV shows, stop it. Go and watch new TV shows, go talk to strangers, go gather as many experiences as you possibly can because you'll go in your brain and pull that stuff out and use that in making your photographs. You know, in fact, I even give a lecture on the importance of talking to people in elevators. You know, it's like that's such a taboo, right? Elevator conversation. Yeah, it's yeah. like everybody gets in there like, oh my God, I can't I'm so talk to you. so claustrophobic. Yeah, but you're like, hey, nice belt. I love those shoes, you know? And then there's a way that, you know, you can kind of break the ice with people. Yeah. And then you gather more information. You know, people are so plugged into the same stuff, I think, and that's, I think that's detriment, you know, to creativity and, and to image making. That's all the time we have. Thank you for being here and for giving us insight into the art of photography. It's been fun. Thank you. Thank you. So photography has a future after all. Well, that's all for this episode of ECTV. We'll see you next time.